Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Kathleen Barry, an internationally recognized human rights activist. She is the author of five books, including Unmaking War, Remaking Men, Female Sexual Slavery, Prostitution of Sexuality, The Global Exploitation of Women. Today we talk about prostitution. So first off, thank you for your fabulous work, and thank you for being on the program. Oh, glad to be with you, Derek. And so my first question is, do you consider prostitution to be a human rights violation? And if so, why? Yeah, um, my work is focused on uh, working with and interviewing women who have been in prostitution. Um, And one of the things that we hear over and over again is what customers do when they buy women to use them for sex. And we're starting to get these stories actually in print now, as many women who've been in prostitution are starting to tell their stories um, and tell what actually men, what men actually do. You know, in female sexual slavery, I focused on pimps putting women into prostitution, and then that becomes sexual slavery, the situations they can't get out of. But in prostitution of sexuality, I moved further to to recognize um, more deeply how men actually buy women, not for sex, but to sexually abuse them. And just the buying is sexual abuse in that it is it is sexual objectification. They're not buying a human being. They're buying an object to put their penises in, to, in whatever way they choose. And without any um, protection uh, for the women. I mean, once, once a woman is picked up by a man who pays her, she can try to exert control, um, but her control is very limited to the extent, uh, is very limited by the customer's demand. And he's invariably stronger and, um, uh, and all of those kinds of things. As I began to look at this and began to talk more and more with women who've been in prostitution. I went back and looked at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And and the very fundamentals of the, that's a UN uh, document, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And and this, this buying of women really turns into a human rights violation, including the right to be, including and especially the right to live free of torture, Um, because a lot of what goes on is a kind of sexual uh, torture uh, of women and and anybody who's bought for prostitution, Um, but as we know, it's primarily women. Uh, So that's how I got around to understanding it as a human rights violation and uh, began work several years ago with UNESCO to address that in developing a new global human rights law. But before I I get to that, I know you and I had talked about the Nordic model and the importance of that in this conversation and talking about prostitution. First of all, we know that that um, prostitution is being normalized in this society into being called sex work. Um, and that's a trick of the sex industry, which is a global multi-trillion dollar industry of sexual exploitation. Um, and from the sex industry, then, women who are in prostitution, some women, very few, but some women in prostitution, then will be claiming um, that what they're doing is work 
and it's a job like any other. Well, sexual torture is not a job like any other, nor is it work. Um, and as we have been working on this issue, and I've been working on this for since 1979 when my Female Sexual Slavery was published, as we've been working on this issue, the government of Sweden, um, at the behest of, in, connected with the, the feminist movement, feminist women in Sweden, uh, took up a new law in the late 1990s under their Violence Against Women Act. They made the buying of prostitution, the buying of women to use them for prostitution, as a crime. So since then, they have been arresting men who buy women. Wait, can and we children? Can we yeah. con- contrast that with the United States? Isn't isn't it the isn't it the women who are criminalized in the United States for the right. most part? Yeah, both. Well, yeah, women. The women who are bought are criminalized. Um, the customers legally are criminalized, and as are the pimps. But when the arrests are made. It's the women who are bought that are arrested. Customers are rarely arrested. Now, since this new Swedish law has really taken on, we're starting to see some change in that. In fact, um, just this year, there was um, a conference of mayors, um, mayors from all over the United States meet in a conference, I guess it's every few years, and they unanimously adopted a resolution to support the criminalizing of customers and taking the laws off of the women. Because if the women are recognized as victims, then you don't criminalize them. And so we have some movement within this country um, that, that's very progressive and very hopeful on this issue. And the Council of Mayors is not the only, you know, the only thing place that this has been developed. Um, what happened then is in Sweden, um, over a 10-year period, prostitution was dr- reduced by 50%, and trafficking was eliminated. And can you now, tell... Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to ask, what is the difference between prostitution and trafficking? Good point. I like to give us, because we're very used to, we know very well about um, the slavery of um, of uh, African Americans in this country. Because we all, you know, learned about it, we see it, there's stories about it, There's we read about it, we hear about it all the time. Could you imagine if slavery of blacks in the United States was treated as bad only because they were captured in Africa and brought across the ocean. That's trafficking. It's moving them from one place to another. But then we just stop. We don't think about what happens to them after they're brought to this country. It's kind of unthinkable. I mean, we know that they're put on plantation. We know all of that history of slave masters' abuse. Um, The trafficking in women is the only form of human trafficking where we have traditionally rule, you know, developed laws against that, but allowed the ongoing exploitation and criminal acts against women after they have been trafficked into um, prostitution. So the trafficking only refer not, not only, but the trafficking refers to movement of human beings from one place to another for the purpose of criminally uh, exploiting them. And then in that place, we then turn to the laws against slavery, the laws um, uh, against uh, drug abuse, and to all the other laws to stop the the consequences of the trafficking. Trafficking is only how you get them there. And you brutalize them in the process. So it's not only very criminal, it is a huge violation of 
human rights, but it doesn't stop for women with trafficking into prostitution. It's the only, only the very beginning. The next thing that happens is they're put into brothels or they're controlled by pimps. Um, they're put out on the streets and controlled by pimps. Um, and and even if they can break away from that, which very few can, they're, um, there's still not a way for them in most places to to break out of prostitution itself. In the last, the uh, back, I want to go back to the Nordic model again because there's one one other aspect of that law that's really important. It not only criminalizes the customer; the pimps are already criminalized, as they have been in most states. It criminalizes the customer, um, and and it recognizes the women as victim, but it also provides funding for support services for the women so that shelters are organized, counseling services are provided. Women getting out of prostitution have enormous health problems, um, tremendous need for counseling and uh, job training and a whole transformation, housing, um, you know, a safe place to, to be. And what we have seen now is that that program, that law in Sweden and its success, which is now recognized by the people, 72% of the people of Sweden now support this law, um, which shows us how much a legal change like this can change um opinions in the, pop, the general population. Um, we now have this law in Norway, which has also just released a report on the success of the law there. Um, it has been adopted um, in Iceland. It is going through the very last stages of approval in um, uh, France. Uh, it's in process in the legislative process in Ireland. It has been gone. It's gone through a process in Israel. It has just been adopted with a slight modification yesterday in Canada. It needs one more series of votes. It's been adopted by one house of par parliament, and it needs the another set of votes before it will go into law in Canada. So we're taking this now as more than just a trend, but as the 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 thing that is about to to come worldwide in terms of the shift in prostitution and the recognition of it as a violation of human rights. So I have a, a few directions to possibly go, and so I want to I want to list a couple of these directions, and you can either choose the order or choose which ones you want to go to. Okay. Um, one of them is the sort of how would you say that women end up prostituted quite often and sort of contrast that, if you will, with, say, the pretty women myth, the pretty woman movie myth, and how did the pretty – what does the pretty woman myth mean? And so there's one, one area. And another area – is that unfortunately over the last couple of years I've um, had to read a lot of queer theory to critique it. And so I'm wondering both from a queer theory perspective, which I'm guessing you dislike as much as I do. Um, Probably. <laughs> I don't read it because I can't read it. Anyway, go ahead. Yes, yes, I totally get you on that. You don't even have to finish the sentence. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I guess the larger question would be, what are some of the critiques that are thrown at the Nordic model and then your response to those critiques? Okay, so that's the easy one. But the important question is the first one you ask. So I'm going to just get rid of the easy one. The, um, the critique that is thrown at the Nordic model and thrown at us feminists who are campaigning globally for this is that and it's this is pure capitalist liberalism it's market economy um uh, rhetoric um 
and it's uh, interestingly coming at us from progressives. Um, and that is that um, that women choose this, and and everybody should be able to choose what they want to do. And no woman should be um, uh, treated. No woman should not. Uh, every woman should be allowed to choose this. Let me put it that way. Um, and none of us should interfere with her free choice. And of course, we know that free choice. Well, we don't have it, literally, in the United States. If I had free choice, my life would be so entirely different. Um, so would this country. Um, but it, what we know is that that's, that is the uh, rhetoric to drive the economy. I have free choice to go out and buy. And when I'm not buying, and a lot of us are not buying, we've been really urged by even our president uh, to get out and buy because that's where we're exercising our choice. Mm. Buying, um, but they, they are technically selling. And so it's all playing into this free market economy. But what it does, and by the way, this is the current position of Amnesty International globally, which is quite frightening to think of a human rights, a major global human rights organization um, with, so rooted in such a deep um, woman-hating and misogyny. But what, what, what this really is ignores is the answer to the first question you ask. How do women get into prostitution? We know that the the percentage ranges probably from, you know, 85 to 92 percent of women who have been in prostitution were sexually abused by male adults as children. Now that tells us a lot. I mean, it tells us a lot the the effect of the breakdown of the human human resilience by sexual abuse, by men's sexual abuse of, um, of children. Uh, but we also know that when women are steeped in poverty, this is another thing that, that globs right onto the capitalist uh, framework of our society. Prostitution is a um, a way for women to get their hands on money when they're closed out of other jobs. They may just be supporting themselves. They may be supporting themselves and their child or children. They may have um, run away from an abusive husband. All of these things feed into it. Um, but if they are homeless, if they're out on the streets, if they're um, hanging on um, by, uh, by a thread, um, we'll find that then numbers of women will turn to prostitution just to get their hands on cash, just to get food for their children and themselves, just to pay next month's rent. Um, we add on to that then a glorification of that whole thing of prostitution as a reserve labor force for women so that the traditional labor force does not have to um, find ways to, to accommodate women and to provide jobs. Uh, built onto that, then, we have fads that get, that get built where young women going to college finding that they can't afford the tuition will then pick up on what's called this sugar daddy phenomena where there's there's actually um online uh programs that will hook up women looking for sugar daddies with wealthy men who will keep them 
um, in high style and pay their tuition and whatever else in exchange for um, a kind of a dating rights and uh, sexual rights to them. That would be what what Julia Roberts was portraying in Pretty Women. Um, we did see, in, however, in that movie, which we don't see anymore, uh, how painful that was for her. Uh, you know, I, I, I watched a... Um... I don't remember what it was, but I was watching a BBC mystery a couple of weeks ago where um, one of the characters was a woman who we later find out is – one of the protagonists was a woman who was making $10,000 a night or something. And, you know, she had – she had uh, – she lived in a fancy penthouse, et cetera. And this is this is something that we – sometimes see on on um in the, in the mainstream media where prostituted women actually end up being at the very least upper middle class and i'm wondering if you can give me some numbers on um i mean it it just seems to me that having driven down east sprague in spokane you know from one store to another and seeing women walking on the streets that uh this the that the, the media is often misrepresenting what the reality of the circumstances are. Yeah, they are misrepresenting it, but they're also doing it to promote it. Um, and and that's where they have their their connections to the sex industry, because if a woman thinks that she can make ten thousand dollars a night, or even ten thousand dollars a week. Um, it, it starts to seem like a, a possibility, like an alternative um, for her. What I, I don't, we don't have numbers, but we know that it's a, a very small percentage. But it is growing, and it's not ten thousand dollars. I mean, it a night. Um, that's really very rare. Um, but the sugar daddy phenomena is. Mm-hmm has um taken on taken been taken up among some college students. I was talking about this in class when I was still teaching, and um one of the women got up and walked out of class in, in the middle and she came into my office a couple of days later, furious with me about um uh, my neg- my negative approach to her prostitution, and then explained to me that it was the only way she was getting through college. And she defended it, and she railed, and I sat and listened to her. Um, and it, and she kept making the point over and over again that if if she wasn't doing this, she wouldn't be able to pay her tuition. She wouldn't be able to buy the books, and books are so expensive now. Um, and And, of course, this is a way that college becomes more and more, you know, for upper-class kids because these young, these kids, these working-class kids are really trying. And so she went on like this, and I finally said, I understand. I'm sorry if anything I said to you suggested that I was um, putting you down because what I'm doing is is going after the men in the institution that's making this possible. Well, she said, I would only be, if they weren't making it possible, I wouldn't be able to get this money. And I said, I understand that. Um, But let me ask you a question. If you had any way to to, to to get your tuition other than this, would you still be in prostitution? Absolutely not. She would have nothing to do with it. She went from a complete defense of it to as soon as I opened up the possibility that the question of if you had a choice, would you do it? She was out of there. She wasn't out of prostitution. But it was quite clear that it's desperation that's driving a lot of these women. They put a a kind of clever 
the 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 young women put this very um, kind of chic uh, twist onto it, like they they have the Gucci bags and they have you know the the fancy clothes and um, they can report back on these wonderful places that they have been to. But they've lost something of themselves, and she knew that while we were talking, that she, every time a customer was buying her, that she was losing something of herself. And I wanted so desperately to be able to offer her, you know, something that, that, that would provide her the means um, to get through college without doing that. Um, so anyway, that's the kind of, I think that the behind all of this glitziness is desperation on the part of most of the women who are doing it for economic reasons. The women who have been sexually abused uh, previously, often it takes quite a bit of time for them to recognize how that being abused, being reduced to an object, being treated as something that could just be taken having no regard for their person um, just, you know, makes, um, makes them much more vulnerable to prostitution. But women get, once they're out of it, just like women when, who are abused by their husbands, once they're out of it, they tell a very different story than when they're in it. So, um, okay, before I ask this question, I want to be really clear that I... I'm in complete agreement with you on all this. Um, and I'm just trying to articulate distinctions here. I mean, one of the arguments mm -hmm. is, of course, that this is, quote, sex work. Mm -hmm. And I think you and I would both probably agree that the whole wage economy is, um, is set up where people end up doing jobs they don't like. You know, most people work jobs they don't like. And it's it's wonderful mm -hmm. when people can can make a living doing something they love, um, but that's not mm -hmm. the reality for most people under capitalism. So having said that, there still seems to me to be a, and also I want to be really clear, that I would not want to walk down the street and have random people give me money to, to uh, sexually use me. Mm -hmm. um, but, so what, can, can, what, what is the difference between getting a job you don't like at Walmart or at any other place and being prostituted? What, what, I, I really want to shoot down the sex work idea. I mean, there, it seems to right. me that there's a fundamental difference in terms that sex is different than flipping burgers. Yep. Um, and it's a very important question. And here I will, I will go back to um, what I said at the very beginning of this conversation, that what men do to women when they buy them to use them for sex is sexual abuse. So it can involve um, uh, being beaten and being... I, when I was doing research, I was talking to one woman on the street who... Um, took off her sweater um, and he had a kind of very skimpy tank top on and showed me her back and it was all slashed from a, a trick customer the night before. Part of the sex act. Um, but we don't even need to talk about that kind of abuse. The very sex itself is abusive. Men will want to urinate on women, defecate on them. Um, humiliation is a, of the women is a really major part of what men do when they buy them. They're, I, over and over again, when we see the stories of um, uh, women um, talking about what they had to go through. Um, for, uh, from a customer um, you know they, they can talk about rape they can talk about being beaten um, 
but when they actually get down to what the sex is, it is sexual abuse. It and it it may involve um, inserting the penis in different places that the woman doesn't want. It um, it it's there was a some feminists put up a um, a, a billboard uh, that they took a cop a photo of and put it up on Facebook recently that said um, qualifications for sex work being able to suppress your gag reflex when something's pushed down your throat you gag to do prostitution you have to learn to get over that gag reflex um, being able uh, be, having been sexually abused being been traumatized um, I can refer you, uh, I can refer our listeners to a book that will be coming out soon. I think I have just heard that a publisher, an American publisher, has picked up and is going to be publishing a book by an Irish woman called "Paid for: My Journey Through Prostitution." The author is Rachel Moran, M-O-R-A-N. She gives she takes you on that she takes the reader on that journey and i defy anybody to read that book and go through all the things you know just go through reading all of the things that she experienced in prostitution and see it as any way similar to flipping a hamburger or checking out customers at walmart or being on a factory line those may be dead end jobs, but they're not destroying the the lives and putting into trauma. You you know this is an interesting fact that more women in prostitution have post traumatic stress disorder than men from the military. I mean that's what this does to them. So yes. Anyway, I think I've made my point. <laughs> I think I made the point that you were um, also wanting to see uh, really exposed here. Well, and, and I appreciate you for that. Well, and thank you for your answer. I, I would just like to to round this out a little bit more. That that even if there is not defecating on someone, or even if there is not forcing something down their throat, even if the uh, customer were not overtly um grossly i don't know disrespectful there still seems to me to be a fundamental even if even if the sex were were relatively i don't know how to say this um benign not, but thank you um it seems to me that there's still a difference between um yes the difference is that you are still an object who has been bought to be used. You are not a subject who is a human being engaging in something that you want to be doing for your own pleasure and to be able to give pleasure to another person. One of the acts that is required of women in prostitution is that they perform as if they are happy to be doing this as if they they um, like these men um, as if these men are just the end of their world one right after another um, and that acting is part of what separates them from themselves it's it's part of the deepening of the objectification I not only am being used as an object, I have to act as if I like being used as an object. And this is, as you said, without the, the urinating on my face, without um, the slashes on my back. Um, yeah, that's, the, that's where it, it goes back to the first question that you asked. That's where the fundamental violation of human rights begins. Well, and thank you for that. And two two things. One is that if you read, um, uh, there's a 
there's a website I've gone to some that is called um, uh, Invisible Men, I believe it is, which mm-hmm. is which is uh, basically um, consumer reports by men about their experiences of women as when they when they buy a woman, um, mm-hmm. and it's it's very disturbing. And one of the phrases that's used, or one of the initial acronyms that's used, is GFE, which is girlfriend experience, and that's one of the things that the the, the women are supposed to provide. So I'm just I'm just validating what you just said. And I want to I want to say that, and then I want to mention that years ago I wrote a novel in which um, a couple of the characters are prostituted women, and before I wrote the novel, I had a bunch of conversations with Norma Hotling. Um, mm-hmm. who was, she's now dead, who, who, what was the name of the organization that she ran? Um, uh, um, um, it's still going in San Francisco. Um, uh, it was, it's an organization to help prostituted women out and also to, right. um, she ran schools uh, that when men were arrested, they had to go to her school. But the reason I bring her up is because she said basically she she told me a lot of of very important things to to put in the novel and she said okay here's one thing that I don't care what else you'd say and what else you do but it's incredibly important that um a these women not fall in love with any of the customers because it doesn't happen and b it's really important that these women hate the men who are using them and that yeah. Uh, I, I guess that's all. I just wanted to, to mention that that was let the me, thing she focused on. Let me mention a couple of things here because you're really, really getting to the core of it, as you always do, Derek. I, you're, you're thinking on these issues just is is so refreshing to me. I think you're very much a, a model of for men of what it could be like to not be, you know, seeing women um, as ex- something to exploit. Well, thank you. Um, a couple of things to mention of, of resources. One is there's a, a Danish woman named Tanya, and that's T-A-N-J-A, Ram, R-A-H-M. I suggest to your listeners that they Google her for the statement that she made to, she has made to customers um, about what women who are being bought experience. And it's very much along the lines of what Norma Hotelling told you, only she's just written a kind of declaration. You think we're doing this. Well, this is what we're really doing. And it's, a, it's a short. It's only one page, and it's a very, very powerful statement. I also want to, if you, if you don't mind, I want to jump back to the beginning of, our, um, uh, of this interview where we talked about prostitution as a violation of human rights. In my book, Prostitution of Sexuality, I've made the argument for that, for prostitution being a violation of human rights. But also, I worked with UNESCO to develop new international human rights law that would recognize prostitution as a violation of human rights and include all of the aspects of, um, uh, for example, the law in Sweden. But it it would address all forms of sexual exploitation, um, which would include everything um, from um, female genital mutilation to buying women for prostitution to rape to the whole the whole works um, and recognizing sexual and that would be to recognize sexual exploitation as a violation of human rights I am now working with some groups and organizations toward getting that introduced into the United Nations because even though we're going state by state, and there's a parallel to this to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, back in 64, um, 
when racism in the South is, is as severe as it's starting to get again today, um, uh, we could not rely on southern states adopting um, civil rights legislation. And so we went to the federal government and got the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which not only addressed um, racism but also sexism, and made it a law of the land. We're doing a similar thing with this um, convention. We can't rely on every state in the world to adopt the laws that Sweden and Norway and other countries have ad adopted or are adapting. We need an overall um, treaty, which is what this would be, a treaty that the United Nations would make with every state in the world that, that could get to sign on to it, which would then involve that the state change its laws in conformity to that treaty. So it's um, it's the global version of what we had as a federal law in this country. Have I made that more confusing, or is that clear? No, it seems it seems very clear to me. Okay. Um, so I guess you you've kind of answered this question. I think actually you kind of answered this question with the whole interview. But if you were suddenly to get your wish list of what you could uh what you could put in place they suddenly make you sort of um you know dictator or director general of all things associated with this issue um what what would be your wish list you'd want the nordic model in place um and are there other things that you would want i would want <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> i would want men to stand up as you are doing, and really take on this issue to make sure that the next generation of boys growing up do not carry into manhood with them the kind of misogyny that allows men today to think that they can buy women to use them for sex, or take them and rape them, or any other thing. I would really, really like to see a massive movement of men and we've been doing this as women for decades, and we're still doing it. But it, until men actually change the way that they behave toward women so that it will affect the next generation of women, of, of boys, growing up to becoming men all over the world, this is going to continue. Because this... This kind of objectification of men, unfortunately, as you well know, is still considered manly and is still considered a privilege for men uh, to take up. And <clears throat> work such as I have done and other women like myself is too often ridiculed by men um, as, you know, being... Ah, you just don't like sex, you know, telling us exactly what sex is for them. Um, and so that's that's where I'd see it going because if I had a, if I had a world with a Nordic model, it had the programs for helping women get out and get their lives back together. Um, but I have um, a world where men would not touch any human being. Um, to sexually abuse and exploit them. And in fact, any human being would not touch any human being to, to sexually abuse them and exploit them. Um, so, yeah, that would be my big biggest wish right now. Well, that's great. And it it reminds me of a couple, three things. One of them is that, oh, like a year ago, I was watching one of those 2020 Dateline programs or something with my mom, and... Mm -hmm. Uh, it was there was a some guy had made a ton of money in Silicon Valley or somewhere, and he then was um, buying for sex these uh, women who like one of them was a Playboy playmate or something. And the the point of me bringing this up is that there was a line in there that completely blew me away, which is the narrator who was a male 
said that this guy was living every man's dream. And let's leave off for a second the notion that every man's dream is having sex with lots of stereotypically beautiful women. Let's just leave that off. But it's like he's buying them. I mean, I don't right. – that's, that's, they're not – okay, we, even if we grant them that maybe it is, quote, every guy's dream to have sex with lots of, quote, beautiful women, which I'm not going to grant, but let's just grant that for a second, he's still having to pay for them. I mean, that's, that's – that's extraordinary that he called – that's extraordinary. It's really ordinary is the unfortunate thing. Right. That he called that every man's dream. That's exactly – I think that's part of what you're talking about right here is is that statement right there is a sign of how messed up things are. Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yep. It, it, it's very – it is It is exactly um, – and, and that's what I mean by the title of my book, The Prostitution of Sexuality. Men have actually turned sexuality itself into a prostituted thing. And for that, we can thank the widespread profusion of pornography, where it can be you know, brought right into the home, and where, it, by the way, those who are used in pornography are prostituted people. Right. And I guess, I guess the, the, the other comment I wanted to make is, do you know Charlotte Watson? I don't think so. Okay, she used to run the domestic violence program for the state of New York, and now she's a women's advocate in the New York court system. She's she's fabulous, an old friend of mine. And one of the things she does is she's relentless. She basically asks every man she sees, what will it take for men to stop beating on women? I, seriously, I've gotten in a taxi cab with her, and she'll say, can you take us to Central Park? And then she'll ask the man, what will it take for men to stop beating on women? Oh, I've heard about her. Oh, she's fabulous. Somebody else told me exactly that story very recently. Um, maybe somebody else knows her, you know? It's like, yeah. this is what she does. She's relentless. And my point in bringing her up is that her answer is we, women, can't do it by ourselves. What it will take is, is we women working, and then in addition, um, it takes men acting in solidarity such that – and the example she gives is some guy saying to another guy – I'm sorry, I can't play basketball with you anymore because I heard you call your girlfriend a bitch. Until you right. apologize and until you no longer do that, I will not play basketball with you. I was on a um, Facebook uh, group uh, yesterday where they were putting up a thing on Monica Lewinsky, ridiculing her and um, calling her a cunt. And I inserted that perhaps if their dicks, um, if photos of their dicks put next to their photos of their faces were perverted and put up on Facebook, maybe they would get a sense of what that's like for women when we see something like that. The response I got was not, oh, gee, I'd never thought about it that way. It was, well, I guess we have somebody on this thread who um, is not uh, has no sense of humor. Um, we're we're running out of time, but that reminds me of something else that that happened that I just found so horrible. There's some BBC program I don't remember the name of it. Um, it's a comedy um, about uh, two gay men living together who snipe at each other. Um, and I read a comment on IMDb. The first comment about it, one of the comments was, I started to watch it and I quit when they made a rape joke, when they made a joke about some woman was too ugly to rape. And, okay, the point is, after that, there were probably 150 comments. That that's all the woman said is that I didn't want to watch this because I found it offensive and I found it triggering. Mm -hmm. And there were probably 100 or 150 comments below that attacking her for saying she has no sense of humor um, saying, how dare you try to censor men, going on and on and on. I found it extraordinary, once again, ordinary, that the level of hatred for her simply bringing this up. Yep. That's, that's what we're dealing with. And it has gotten so much worse in the last 10 years. I, I, I'll link this to war. I think... The fact that we are in a state of ongoing war now 
um, has reverted women's status all over the world significantly and has privileged men's power, men's power over women, and particularly men's sexual abuse of women. Um, and is, and we're seeing that as an, you know, kind of overall condition of our society right now, because this is worse than what we were fighting back in the 60s when the women's movement first started. And that was coming from point zero, where there was no consciousness of feminism, we were creating feminism brand new, and there was no consciousness of it. I'm seeing the privileging that men have for sexual abuse and sexual exploitation now as worse than it was in, in at that time. Um, but I'm also seeing, <clears throat> I think, some of the... Um, uh, some of the racism that's coming out to us is is <clears throat> doing the same kind of thing. Right, right. We're we're in a very bad regression, and if we don't really stand up and fight this, we're we're in bad bad shape. So I guess my last. And I want to say how much I appreciate your consciousness on these issues, Derek, because I think that the more that you can talk about this the more you are going to give the reason and um, uh, encouragement to other men to take this up and that could become something very important well thank you so much for saying that and i want to extend the same compliment to you and i guess my last question here is you've said what you want from men to act in solidarity with women can you say what you would like from women who listen to this interview, what would you want for them to do to help help with all this? To, to stand up to every form of, of sexual exploitation, every form of being put down for being a woman that comes your way. You're going to feel a lot better if you tell them to, excuse me, F off, um, than if you, you know, just, take it or smile and walk away because you don't want people to think that you're being too negative um, because you're going to, you're going to be defending yourself. You're going to be supporting yourself and your own, own humanity. Stand up to it wherever it occurs, whenever it occurs and get yourself to a safe place. Thank you so much for everything you have to say. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Kathleen Barry. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.